Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 2, Part 2. Sunday afternoon and the work went forward with never a hitch. Even Dove and Dusty were good and obedient, though Dove was half-threatening to tell old Grandpa when he got home. Johnny did not care what his master might say. Only, please God, the basin were done, and Mr. Hancock come again and again with his rich orders. If Mr. Lapham was angry, he could sell Johnny's time to Paul Revere. The four girls, still dressed in their pretty go-to-meeting frocks, watched him with fascinated, admiring eyes. Their mother sent them out of doors. Did the smoke from the furnace show from the wharf? From Fish Street? Did they hear any comments? Having found for himself the proper willow charcoal, Johnny went quickly ahead with his casting. He set his two wax models in wet sand. The furnace was piping hot. His hands were very sure. He was confident he could do the work, yet inside he was keyed up and jumpy. Mrs. Lapham fussed about him and he ordered her to do simple things. Not the draft yet, Mrs. Lapham. Now get to work with the bellows. Once he even told her to look sharp and she took it with a humble, yes, Johnny. Now fetch me the crucible. She turned to Dove. Which one does he want, boy? I'll get her down. Dove went to the shelves where the crucibles for melting were kept. Johnny did not see Dove standing on a stool, reaching far back and carefully taking out a cracked crucible. Dusty saw him and giggled. He knew the crack in it was so small it was hard even to see. It might stand the heat of the furnace, but the chances were that it would not. That was why Mr. Lapham had put it so far back. Both he and Dove thought it would just about serve Johnny Tremaine right, after the insufferable way he had been bossing everybody, if the crucible gave way and the hot silver did spill all over the top of the furnace. It would certainly make Johnny look like a fool after all his fussing. Johnny took the cracked crucible in his trusting hands, put in silver ingots, set it on top of the furnace. Scylla flew in. Ma, there's a man looking at our chimney. How's he dressed? Seafaring man. No seafaring man ever objected to a little Sabbath breaking, but mind if you see any deacons or constables. The work went on. The Santa sat with the cat in her lap. Johnny's going to hell, she said firmly. Johnny himself thought this was possible. He called to Mrs. Lapham to look sharp and put the old silver turnip watch where he could see it. The silver must be run at a certain speed and be allowed to cool for just so long. Mrs. Lapham was so slavishly eager to help him, he almost felt fond of her. He did notice Dusty and Dove snickering in a corner. Some of the beeswax he had used for his model had been left too near the furnace. It had melted and run over the floor. Johnny had been taught to clean up as he went along but today he was in too much of a hurry to bother. Johnny, cried Mrs. Lapham, isn't it time to pour? Look, the silver has melted and begun to wink. It was true. He moved forward delicately, his right hand outstretched. The crucible began to settle, collapse. The silver was running over the top of the furnace like spilled milk. Johnny jumped toward it, his right hand still outstretched. Something happened, he never knew exactly what. His feet went out from under him. His hand came down on top of the furnace. The burn was so terrible. He at first felt no pain, but stood stupidly looking at his hand. For one second before the metal cooled, the inside of his right hand from wrist to fingertip was coated with solid silver. He looked at the back of his hand. It was as always. Then he smelled burned flesh. The room blackened and tipped around him. He heard a roaring in his ears. When he came to, he was stretched out upon the floor. Dorcas was trying to pour brandy down his throat. Mrs. Lapham had plunged the burned hand into a panful of flour and was yelling to Madge to hurry with her bread poultice. He saw Scylla's face. It was literally green. Ma, she said, licking her white lips. Shall I run for Dr. Warren? No, no. Oh, wait. I've got to think. 
I don't want any of them doctors to know we was breaking Sabbath day, and we don't need no doctor for just a burn. Scylla, you run down the wharf, and you fetch that old midwife, Grands Hopper. These old women know better than any doctor how to cure things like this. Johnny, how you feel? All right. Hurt yet? Not yet. He knew it would later. Johnny lay in the birth and death room. This was hardly more than a closet with a tiny window off the kitchen, used for storage except in times of sickness. His hand had been done up in a linseed poultice. The smell of the linseed was stifling. And now, on the second day, the pain had really begun. His arm throbbed to the shoulder. Grands Hopper was in the kitchen talking to Mrs. Lapham. Mind you, keep that poultice wet. Just leave it wrapped up and wet it now and then with lime water. There's more luck than anything else in things like this. If it don't come along good, I'll make a charm. Not many years before, Grands Hopper would have been hanged for a witch. She had the traditional venerable years, the toothless cackle, the mustache. Nor was she above resorting to charms. But she had had vast experience. No doctor in Boston knew more than she about midwifery and children's diseases. So far, she had done as well as any of them, except for one thing. The hand had been allowed to draw together, turn in on itself. It was less painful than if it had been held out flat. By the fourth day, ulceration had set in. This was considered nature's way of healing an injury. Grand Hopper gave him laudanum and more laudanum. There followed drowsy days and nights that ran together, a ceaseless roar in the ears. There was nothing left of him but the pain and the drug. The fever abated, and with it the doses of the drug. Johnny had not once looked at his hand since he had stood before the furnace and seen it lined with silver. Grand Hopper said on the next day she would unwrap it and see, as she cheerfully put it, what was left. Thus far, the pain and the drug and the fever had dulled his mind. He had not thought about the future, for what use to anyone was a cripple-handed silversmith? But the next night, Grand Hopper's words haunted him. Next day, she would see what was left. He was utterly unprepared for the sight of his hand when it finally was unwrapped and lay in the midwife's apron lap. Mrs. Lapham, Madge, Dorcas, all had crowded into the little berth and death room. Scylla and Isana were in the kitchen, too frightened to go near him. My, said Madge, isn't that funny looking? The top part, Johnny, looks all right, although a little narrow. But Johnny, your thumb and palm have grown together. This was true. He bent and twisted his fingers. He could not use the thumb to meet the forefinger. Such a hand was completely useless. For the first time, he faced the fact that his hand was crippled. Oh, let me see. Dorcas was leaning over him. She gave her most elegant little screech of horror, just like a great lady who had seen a mouse. My, said Mrs. Lapham, that's worse than anything I had imagined. Now isn't that a shame? Bright boy like Johnny just ruined. No more good than a horse with sprung knees. Johnny did not stay to hear more. That morning, he addressed with Mrs. Lapham's competent help for the first time. He got up, stood facing them stiffly, his bad hand jammed into his breeches pockets. I'm going out, he said thickly. Scylla and Asana sat close together in a frightened huddle, staring at him, not daring to speak. He said rudely, you should have come in too and seen the fun. Scylla gaped at him, tried to say something, but only swallowed. You two sitting there, looking like a couple of fishes. He slammed the front door after him. He'd always been bad about slamming doors. In the fresh air, he felt better. He pretended not to hear Mrs. Lapham calling him from a window to come right back. All Fish Street could hear when Mrs. Lapham called. He paid no heed. 
He walked all over Boston, his hand thrust deep in his breeches pocket. Instinctively, he wanted to tire himself out, which was easy in his weakened condition, so he could not think. When he came back, there was something queer about the silence of the kitchen. No one reproved him because he had disobeyed Mrs. Lapham. He knew they'd all been talking about him. Scylla, for one of the first times in her life, tried to be polite to him. Oh, Johnny, she whispered. I'm sorrier than I was ever sorry before. As Santa said, is it true, like Ma says, you'll be only good for picking rags? Scylla turned on the Santa. You're crazy. Johnny isn't going to pick rags. But, oh, Johnny, it's so awful, and I'm so sorry, and Johnny's face was crimson. Will you stop talking about it? The Santa went on. Madge says it looks awful. If either of you girls, he stormed, ever mentioned that I've even got a hand, I'll, I'll just get on a ship and never come back. I'm not going to have you mucking about with your infernal crybaby. Oh, how dreadfuls. So he went to the shop. He saw with anger that Dove was sitting at his bench, daring to use his tools. He had not been in the shop for a month. Of course, it should be expected that Dove would use his bench for a little while, just until he was back at it himself. Mr. Lapham had looked up from his work, blinked gently, shook his head and sighed. Dusty was making a terrific den in one corner. Johnny stood and watched Dove's clumsy work as long as he could in silence. At last he burst out. Dove, don't hold your crimping iron like that. Dove leaned back. His fat white face grinned up at him with an exaggerated innocence. Thank you, Master Johnny. I know I'm not as good as you are. Won't you please to show me just how I should hold my crimping iron? Johnny walked out of the shop by the door leading to the wharf. He'd never show anybody again how to hold a crimping iron. If you can't do, you had best shut up. He started to slam the door, thought better of it. If you can't do, you'd best not slam doors. So he strolled the length of the wharf. There was a big ship in from Jamaica. He idly watched porters rolling barrels of molasses out of its hold. A sailor was trying to sell an old lady a parrot. He saw John Hancock standing in a group of men. The sugar basin had never been delivered. When Mr. Lapham had discovered the evil that had gone on in his absence and the terrible punishment God had meted out to Johnny Tremaine, he had ordered the whole thing melted down, and he himself had gone over to Mr. Hancock, returned the cream pitcher, and merely said he had found it impossible to make a sugar basin. No explanation. The boy was accustomed to working from 8 to 12, sometimes 14 hours in a day. He had no holidays, no Saturday afternoons. He had often imagined to himself the pleasure it would be just to stroll once down Hancock's wharf as he was strolling now. Nothing to do, his hands in his pockets. Other boys, friends of his, would look up from their work, envy his idleness. Here and there he would see a familiar face. He believed every one of them was talking about his burn, pitying him. There was not a boy on the wharf Johnny did not know. He had made friends with some and enemies of others, and he had played or fought with all of them. He saw Saul and Dicer packing salt herring in a tub. Andy, his leather thimble strapped to his palm, sewing a sail. Tom Dinker, the local bully, coopering a barrel. This was Johnny's world, but now he walked through it, an alien. They knew what had happened. They did not envy Johnny's idleness. He saw one nudge another. They were whispering about him, daring to pity him. Dicer's master, the herring pickler, yelled some kind of remark to him, but Johnny did not answer. Seemingly in one month, he had become a stranger, an outcast on Hancock's wharf. He was maimed, and they were whole. I see we're running long, so we're going to stop here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.